Hello and welcome. My name's Matt, and today we're going to discuss The Lords of Silence by Chris Raitt. This is a deep dive into Death Guard lore in the Warhammer 40k universe. Before I waste a bunch of your time, uh, let's go over some of the stuff that, that'll come up uh, during this essay. Think about these questions. If they're interesting to you, I got some answers. So, you know, how does Death Guard armor function? It's rotten and old, has teeth coming out of it. How does that work? What's it like being the host of dozens of different specialized diseases that would kill any one person? Uh, how does a ship that looks like a festering liver even make its way through space? Why would someone call chronic consumption a gift? Uh, why is Nurgle always so happy? Uh, and obviously these spaceships in the 40k universe are massive and they require tons of people to operate on a daily basis. Where do those people come from? If these questions sound cool to you, I assure you we've got the answers and you have come to the right place. Now, this is not a review. I love the whole book, cover to cover, but as I read it, I found that its value was in its perspective. Specifically, uh, it follows a ship full of Nurgle's Death Guard servants and is mostly from their point of view, which is pretty screwed up. It's as if you were reading It by Stephen King, but from the perspective of Pennywise. Now, from my perspective, Nurgle and the Death Guard are pretty rad, uh, but when it comes down to it, the devil's in the details, and this book goes a long way into answering a bunch of whys and hows, what makes them tick. Our goals are somewhat straightforward. You know, we're looking to get a deeper understanding of the Death Guard and how they operate. They're monsters, but they're not just monsters. They've got layers. If you're totally new to Warhammer 40k, maybe this essay makes you want to learn more, which would be pretty cool. We're diving into the deep end, but I'm here with you. I'm just getting started myself. This is my first book from the Black Library, and I've only been digging on 40k for a couple months. I've been painting models, reading, learning rules and such. I'm sure to make some mistakes here, but if I know the internet, someone out there will correct me. Possibly with more misinformation, and that's okay. You'll also note that I'm not going to move fast. I'm not going to use jump cuts, or even try to get there succinctly. That's just not how I do things. This isn't going to be quick or for that matter painless. Perhaps though, if you make it a decent stretch, you'll understand why. There are definitely going to be spoilers. We're trying to do an analysis here, not a review. Um, I don't know if you'll ever read the book, but I got to touch on some plot points just to illustrate concepts. I'll try to drop some definitions on the left uh, and some descriptions too as I come along stuff that you know you, you might need some cliff notes to, uh, but I'm pretty much going to stick with the book as much as I can. If you really want to like get your head around all of Warhammer 40k and lose your mind in the process, I highly recommend uh, checking out every single Warhammer 40k faction explained uh, by Bricky. It's got a brilliant views for a reason, it's amazingly well done, and is a very good survey uh, of the different factions in the universe. If you want to go even further, I would recommend checking out warhammer40k.fandom.com for the deepest of dives uh, if you're okay with losing your mind. This is Zero to 40k. I imagined that I had encountered all possible cruelties. For a long time, I had understood the worst pain was to be denied that for which we thirsted. The centuries passed, each colder than the last, and that knowledge was the sharpest thorn my father had left in our flesh. But I have been wrong so often before, and so I was again then. In those days, once the despoiler had broken the wheel of fate, and our jail's walls crumbled around us, we learned just how far we still had to go. The greatest cruelty, you see, was not being deprived of what we wanted. The greatest cruelty, as it turned out, was being given it. Getting underway, the Solace, a ship that, as we've already described, uh, this is the one that actually looks like a festering liver, uh, which we'll get into more a little bit later, uh, is mustering with a bunch of other forces of chaos uh, inside the warp, looking to break through the Eye of Terror, uh, mess up the boundary between the warp and our reality, and have all of these forces go and uh, kind of attack everything. I mean, some of them are going to head to Terra, which is our Earth. Uh, some of them have other agendas going around. But uh, at its core here, this guy, 
uh, Abaddon the Despoiler, who's not really a leader of chaos, but sort of a cult of personality. Uh, he calls for a muster of all the Chaos War bands. So we've got World Eaters, uh, who I think follow Corn. we've got Death Guard, those are our boys, they follow Nurgle. Uh, there's Thousand Sons, they follow Zinch, who's all about change and scheming and stuff. There's like Black Legion and Night Lords who are like universalists. They, they basically worship all four of the Chaos Gods. They're all piling up in this one staging area uh, waiting for Abaddon and his flagship to show up. Uh, some of the forces of Chaos have been chilling out in the warp kind of bored uh, for quite some time. Not the least of which is the, the Death Guard mostly as a whole. There's this guy, Typhus, who's been zipping around doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but Mortarian, uh, who's the leader of the Death Guard, he's a Primarch, uh, which means he's a direct descendant, genetically speaking, from the Emperor. Um, he's pretty moody, he's kind of emo. Uh, he's had his own little like personal quest going on, uh, but he hasn't really interacted much with uh, the, the realm of man. Uh, so you've got a lot of these groups that have been on the sidelines for a while, and now it's time to bring them all together and, uh, and finish what Horus started back in the 30,000s, early 30,000s. Now, what Horus started back in the day was an attempt to overthrow the Emperor. Horus himself was a Primarch, uh, which makes him a direct descendant of the Emperor, uh, and he, he fell to chaos and decided to support these four chaos gods uh, and try to take down the Emperor. So, uh, Abaddon is sort of the spiritual successor, you could say, uh, so he's kind of looking to finish that work. Chaos, as you might imagine, is a bit hard to wrangle. So even while this massive, epic, many thousands of ships fleet is mustering, there's infighting. You know, someone will get on the radio, talk trash to someone else, uh, and then broadsides will open up, and you know, five or ten ships will just be gone. Uh, there's uh, amongst the Chaos Gods' followers, uh, there's some pretty strong rivalries. But you have to understand that that chaos broadly as a force can can shoulder this that's kind of how they work you know someone might write up a plan uh but it's it's like wrangling you know two-year-olds that all want ice cream and there's only one scoop lying around uh, they can afford to lose ships and not in a very strategic way because uh, they could backfill their forces um, not indefinitely but a lot of times they're summoning demons and uh it's really hard to keep uh, mankind's planets in line, and so there's always uprisings where, you know, new forces are generated from humans that decide to turn to chaos. True to form, uh, our, our Death Guard boys show up pretty late to the muster. Uh, when it comes to chaos forces, at least when it comes to, like, heretic space marine groups, uh, the Death Guard tend to be the least frantic outwardly all the time. Uh, they tend to sort of chill in the back, they always go slow, so them showing up late is very, very typical. You know, it's like that person you knew in high school who never makes it in time for homeroom. That exact vibe. The Death Guard, when they do incite change, it, it's overwhelming and carries the weight of inevitability. You know, by the time you can smell them or hear them, it's too late, and this permeates through so much of what they do. And so them showing up basically last before Abaddon himself in the flagship is totally on brand. Uh, but everything that they do happens in the fullness of time. It's, it's not a laziness, it's just it's the opposite of being frantic. Now I've heard some folks try to, in some memes, try to categorize Nurgle with uh, alongside Sloth. And I don't really agree with that. You know, Sloth denotes an inherent laziness that doesn't really apply here. You know, the, the Lords of Silence are always honing and refining, whether that be, you know, some new plague strain or some new corrosive substance uh, or some long-running idea of how to get things done. Uh, they just don't make a show of it until game day. And we'll see this later uh, when they get to a planet called uh, Sabatine, uh, because you get a sense that like it feels like they're just showing up, but they have all of these sort of... I don't want to call them schemes, because that's not their realm, uh, but they're very ready when they show up. Uh, and we'll also get uh, another look at that when we do a deep dive of how this ship, Solace, 
operates. So boom, uh, whatever ritual needs to happen, Abaddon's there, they tear open the Eye of Terror and this entire fleet, which yeah, it's missing a few ships, but nobody really cares because uh, it's all just a numbers game, uh, bust through, there's a big tear in the universe that makes some places not really navigable anymore, but now this whole fleet uh, is now in normal space, the void, uh, where people and Xenos live. And the opening strike <clears throat> is to attack what are mankind's main buffer defenses outside the Eye of Terror. Um, the Eye of Terror is, is known to be a conduit to the warp, so they have a few planets set up there, uh, notably a planet called Cadia. Uh, Cadia, you're going to hear a lot about in lore. Uh, the fall of Cadia, this, this is where the fall of Cadia happens. Um, it's an opening blow of this campaign of chaos. Uh, it's the first big uh, defense planet. Uh, it is sort of bolstered by another planet called Agrippina, uh, which builds a bunch of weapons of war. And uh, the Battle of Agrippina is where Solace sees its first real combat duty. Agrippina, the closest great forge world to Cadia. Agrippina, the source of its finest armaments, its titan legions, its heavy armor, and its ranged artillery. Agrippina is an iron world, never at rest, studded with foundries and seas of liquid metal. Its skies are lead gray. Its surface clad in unbroken construction. No hives, no halves pucker its ancient surface, only manufactoria, kilometer after kilometer of them. Dazzling the mortal mind. Yep, everything's big here. So Solace and its captain set it, uh, their sights, um, and that's actually a, a pretty accurate statement, uh, on this one big ship that they figure out is carrying this mega huge gun on it that hasn't been deployed yet, and it's sort of trying to scoot away from the battle. And so Solace pulls up on this ship, uh, it takes a, a good set of broadside shots on it, and then Solace's captain, uh, this guy Vorx, uh, has it do this crazy maneuver to sort of see into this bay that's opening up uh, where this huge gun is. And once he recognizes it, he takes the ship on this slow, deliberate maneuver so that it's the belly of Solace is now facing this open bay on this mega ship. And what it does, and this is really wild, uh, is it opens up, it vents its guts as a ship. Um, so if you think about Solace as an actual nautical vessel, um, it has a bilge, which is like, you know, this section at the bottom of the ship where traditionally stuff builds up and it's kind of gross. And so when they say, man, the bilge pumps, like they're trying to pump this water and gunk out of a normal ship. For Solace, this is an organic, semi-organic ship, and it is run and lived in by a, a Death Guard company and it's absolutely gross down there and when I say gross I mean there's new brands of plagues growing up out of this primordial oozy crap underneath there over centuries and centuries uh, things are, are being born in the depths dying, getting sick uh, it's absolutely horrifying stuff and so the ship basically dumps all that crap out uh, on this opponent massive ship and just corrodes it to the point where it can't function anymore. In just a minute we're going to talk a ton about Solace as a ship, uh, how it makes sense, how it's a little incomprehensible, um, but before we move forward we're just going to hit three very essential themes that come up throughout the book. These are super important to sort of get your head around, and I'm probably just going to leave them on the bottom of the screen and highlight them as they come up. Uh, but the first is death and rebirth. This is Nurgle's bread and butter. It's complex. It's steeped in chaos. It's not... Um, it uses the imagery around it in twisted ways, but it's not a conventional uh, humankind fully perception of it. Uh, it's Some people say, well, it's just the cycle of life, but we tend to think about that in a, in a very human-centric sense of, like, I was born, I get old, I die, and maybe you take it as far as I'm buried, I rot, something grows out of me. Uh, in the case here, it's often uh, a multi-looped cycle of that 
where different parts of that cycle are happening at different times within the same space or organism or thought. Uh, so it's it's like you have that ring of, of death and rebirth, but it's many of them all at the same time. Kind of like this old guy, somewhat Nurgle-like guy. He's got the smile. He's got the attitude. Uh, this this bottle is one of these, you know, kind of eternal little biosphere experiment things. You take a bottle, uh, you throw a certain kind of growth medium in it, some some seeds, some water, uh, maybe some little bugs and a few other things, and you cap the thing off, and it, with a little bit of sunlight, it can perpetuate as a system, uh, even though many different organisms are in many different states of uh, of germination, of sprouting, of growth, of death. You know, even if you just look at those green leafy plants, like they're sitting on top of the death material of their predecessors at the same time. So it's not really about a singular organism and its arc through its, you know, birth and death. It's about systems, complex systems of things where all these different aspects are in different points of that cycle at the same time harmoniously like this nice old guy with the bottle our second essential theme is inevitability and acceptance and this permeates throughout the religious beliefs of these death guard who worship and serve nurgle uh, they believe that the things that they're going to do will will come about in the fullness of time that they are inevitable and that one of the greatest burdens non-believers have is that they just won't accept the truth that is coming. Uh, they really do believe down in their core that someday, someday, every planet in the universe will be a plague planet uh, in combat and practically everything else. They're very slow because they'll get where they're going eventually. Um, there's no frantic rushing. And uh, many of the Death Guard are, are consciously aware of their existence and what it's like and the mechanics that led them there. Uh, they have friends and enemies, but often they have this attitude of like, well, it, it is what it is. And so it's, it's not a transformation that they're in denial about. Um, as we get into some of the characters more specifically, there, there's some weird blurring of lenses. Um, I don't want to call them rosy colored, maybe like yellow foggy colored, but, um, but a huge part of being someone who's accepted the gifts of Nurgle is, is the acceptance of it, uh, regardless of the sort of face value judgment someone might make. The third essential theme is time and perception. Now, some of the characters in this book go back 10,000 years uh, throughout something uh, that's referred to as the Long War, which is, uh, if you think about the Emperor, 10,000 years ago, all those events, including uh, him becoming a, a not fully dead corpse, uh, all the way up to now, the Horus Heresy. Um, there's, there's Death Guard on this ship that were around back then. Um, there are Death Guard on the ship that were once, not human, but superhuman, you know, gene seed, genetic long descendants from the Emperor, but, like, they were around kicking it. Uh, I think Vorx himself, the, the captain and leader of the war band, um, was just a, a kid um, and was essentially adopted by Mortarian on Mortarian's home planet of Barbarus way back in the day before... I mean, they knew each other before either of them even knew who the Emperor was. Um, and throughout the book, this becomes uh, key to understanding character motivations uh, across the board because it's operating at such a big scale and, and we like to think that you know you get wisdom over time because over time you perceive more things and, and you register them but at the same time uh, 
you know, if you think you probably have memories, I know I do from when I was a little kid, and I'm very convinced that they're like 100% correct memories, and then you go through an old batch of photos and you realize that you sort of cobbled together uh, meaning around an event based on some pictures you saw over the course of your life, and, and that's really where um, your your understanding of that period of time comes from. It's not real. It's not actually what happened. It's it's more of a mosaic of other image that's, images that your brain is as put together. Uh, and this comes up repeatedly with a bunch of these old characters. The ship Solace didn't always have that name. Uh, it was once called the Undying Valor. I think this was back when it was in Imperial service. Um, and I'm going to read a little passage that starts to sort of chip away at what this ship is like now. Borix did not seize the Undying Valor. By the time he became its master, it was already Solace, and was already growing, changing, spiraling slowly down those deep wells of the eye and soaking up all their bottomless malice. For more than 5,000 years, it steeped in that soul liquor, its spars flexing, its innards burning, its hull plates blistering. Its old core began to reform untouched by demon rites or renegade tech marines, but impelled by its own semi-dormant creative impulse. Like so much else in the realm of dreams, physical form began to suffuse with the matter of souls. Continuing on, now it breathes, it has respiration, it has circulation, it has whims and it has moods. If it turns against you, you find corridors suddenly choked with bulging plates and boiling pits of runoff oil. Crew go missing from time to time, even from the ranks of the Unbroken. Unbroken are actually the Space Marines. Sometimes they are discovered much later. Bits of armor, stains on the deck, a faint smell of satisfied ingestion. What we have here is, is more than just a ship. It's a creature, it's a monster, it has moods, it eats, it, 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 it voids its bowels. And so, in a more tangible and concrete way, it, it sort of juxtaposes a lot of narratives from the real world that talk about a ship and you personify it and you call it she and metaphorically you say that it reacts to your touch but this ship solace really does that stuff and does those kinds of things under rules that are are monstrous and savage if you point it at a target that it wants to kill it's going to maneuver more elegantly if you try to make the ship do things that it cognitively doesn't want to do not just metaphorically uh, some of your crew goes missing so it's it's a very complex system and really character in the book unto itself solace is a what's called a repulsive class grand cruiser um, so, you know, it used to be a ship in the Imperium. Uh, it has classification stuff, but it spent all this time in the warp, and so it's, it's changed over and become this living, breathing warp space thing. But, uh, you know, we've talked about about scale already, and, and to put things in perspective, you know, a repulsive class ship, at least when it was in the Imperium, would have a crew of approximately 134 thousand people it's seven and a half kilometers long uh it's just it's just massive and this isn't even like a mega mega huge ship in this universe it's this huge huge essentially floating city uh and and as a result kind of like that that old man with the with the big bottle its layers operate differently in a way that gives it a, a continuity in that, that death and rebirth cycle. So much of the command happens on the upper decks, then there's the gun decks, uh, and then there's the lower decks. And very frankly, as it's described, like the, the lower decks have, have people. 
uh, I don't want to say normal people, but um, they're not uh, the unbroken, which are the the space marines that that serve Mortarian and Nurgle and who are all gene descendants of the Emperor and have this crazy armor and are amazing combatants. We're talking about about human beings that uh, some point, maybe 5,000 years ago, were unfortunate enough to be on this ship when it was taken and, and became a vessel of the warp. It's very common on ships of this size in the Imperium uh, to, to have whole generations of people who are born, live, and die on the same ship, never leaving it. Uh, sometimes these are tradespeople that, you know, I work on the eighth deck that handles, uh, you know, refitting a certain piece of machinery. And I do that much like someone in a village might be the blacksmith. And then I meet someone, uh, get married or mate, have a child. They apprentice under me, still out in space on the same ship. Uh, and then they take on my role and I get old and kind of retire and die. You know, when you think about 134,000 crew out in space for decades and decades and decades, that's what you get. It is a floating city. And Solace is a little different, but not much different. Um, there are people that are mating, that have trades that serve purpose on this vessel for generations and generations and generations. Um, they're called, you know, with a capital P, the population quite often, though that, that distinction gets a little blurred, um, but at least when they're on the ship, when they say that, they mean everybody. And these people lead pretty horribly bleak lives, but, um, But that's how it is. I mean, even if you think about human history, there have been whole classes of people in cities for generations who have lived in smog, you know, probably had a life expectancy of maybe 32 years old. You know, you hopefully meet someone remotely interesting, you have kids, you eventually die. On this ship, that is happening. But we are talking about um, a population of people that is probably born sick, probably has a very short lifespan, uh, is walking around with all manner of terrible conditions, uh, but still, like that bottle, procreating, living off of stuff that can be found on the ship that dies. Um, it's, it's not Im an impossibility that, you know, someone's walking around on the ship somewhere, they trip and fall several things, be them human or poxwalker zombie things, eat that person that falls over, and the ones that carry on live long enough to perpetuate stuff. The filth is phenomenal. Burn deep into every surface so that it feels less like an encrustation and more like the very matter of the world around them. And yet these souls persist here, against all odds, eking out short and strangely fecund lives before the phages bite, after which their superannuated bodily remains are scraped into boiling vats and served up to the next unknowing generation. How cool and absolutely revolting is that? We're talking about roughly 5,000 years of this cycle of death and rebirth, um, in this epic period of time that by our real world conception, you know, goes back farther than most religions really work with, um, you know, with the great pyramids not around yet, like that 5,000 years is like how long this cycle or this system of cycles has been going on on this one ship influenced by Nurgle in the warp. This is, this is as normal as it gets. And it's been that way for thousands of years on this ship. And everyone on the ship as a result, like, like who's, who's gonna act like this is strange. This, this is how it's always been, not for just generations, for generations upon generations back further than humans right now can really trace history at all. 
that's pretty cool. Okay, one more example to sort of hammer home this concept of this cycle of death and rebirth uh, as it relates to, to the ship Solace. Uh, one of the characters at one point is going to take a shuttle off of Solace to another ship and uh, he takes a look at the pilot of the shuttle and, and observes the following. Like most pilots in the service of the Lords of Silence, this one is biologically part of the shuttle limbs and torso fused into a ganglion of wires and pins. Her eyes are hidden by tubes leading to the external sensors, her fingers lost amid the twist and quiver of signal relays. He can see pox on the skin of her exposed neck, and it is advanced. She might last a few more years before either insanity or bodily collapse ends her. Then she will decay into the matter of the shuttle itself, forming a fertilizing layer for its next series of growths and a nutrient-rich base for when Clado, who's the ship's doctor, wires her successor into place. That is all part of the great arc of rebirth, the essence of the great creed for those who care about such things. Now, if you remember from a few minutes ago when I was saying, hey, it's not this like human notion of the cycle of, of death and rebirth, it's, it's more complex than that. It's like multiple systems in that bottle working at the same time in different points of that cycle of death and rebirth. The, the pilot example here is, is a perfect representation of that because we have the ship and Toto, Solace, um, that is this semi-biological, semi-sentient monster plus ship. Um, but even the pilot of this shuttle, as it's described, is a living thing. Uh, it's also melded with machinery somewhat, uh, but it's it's plugged directly into what, you know, whatever this thing is that the Lords of Silence use as a shuttle. It serves its purpose for a period of time. Everybody knows and likely the pilot themselves know they're going to do their job, then die eventually from any manner of however that comes up. They're going to decompose into the vessel they serve, forming a nutrient layer for the next person to be plugged in and carry on the job that their predecessor did. So if you look at the entire machinations, biologically speaking, and I guess mechanically speaking, for, for the Solace and its shuttles and its lower deck crews, it's, it's all of these little microbiomes operating in parallel, but not necessarily in sync with each other all at the same time. It's this beautiful little repulsive, disgusting colony uh, of different things happening, different things growing at different rates, and and that really gets at the heart of a bunch of of like core Nurgle tenets. All the parties involved are absolutely fine with this being how things work. They've accepted it. This is their normal. It is no big deal to have a person who, you know, we might think should have a full roundness of personhood spend the entirety of their adult existence, fuse attached to a shuttle, do their job, die, be gone. Um, it's entirely normal and accepted that people go missing because the ship is in a mood. Uh, sometimes members of the crew will just go like hunt folks for sport because they're bored because all these years are going by. But everyone involved doesn't take this as any sort of injustice or or malice or mistreatment. It's just a part of this whole cycle where no singular component of this uh, microsystem, biological system, micro is not really a good term, um, no part of the whole system failing, kind of like cells in a body, like a couple cells died, no big deal. The point is the whole thing. Uh, for a lot of Nurgle stuff, it's very similar, like their armies, like, yeah, it's okay if 10% of it dies, 
nobody takes it personally but the the army marches on uh you know in a campaign you know you, you take over a planet you your job there isn't to personally punch everyone in the face though the warriors do like punching people in the face um your job there is to is to have plague take over the whole planet so there's not a lot of personal mumbo jumbo that goes on everyone's kind of just cool with how this works and in keeping with our themes uh our dialectic of inevitability and acceptance uh, this is inevitably taking way longer than i thought it would i had hoped to wrap this whole thing up in a half hour but i'm basically a third of the way through uh so accepting that fact we're going to call this uh, act one uh what we've learned about is the ship solace uh it's a death guard ship uh we've learned a bit about uh how it functions how gross it is and we've learned a little bit about chaos in the 40k universe as a whole looking forward in act two we're going to cover a bunch of different characters and essentially classes um, or models uh, if you're playing the tabletop uh, we'll go into a chaos lord some terminators which are absolutely awesome uh, plague marines uh, we'll definitely spend some time on the tally man uh, and a few others uh, i think there's a dreadnought floating around in the story somewhere as well uh, we'll also uh, wrap this section uh, with a little story about what happens when the Lords of Silence land on a farming planet. And I don't think it's a very big spoiler to say it does not go very well for the farming planet. In Act 3, it all comes together. Uh, we'll discuss the Battle of Sabatine, which is a crazy, like, siege battle. There's other chaos forces involved. Uh, there's a Space Marine chapter there that fights back. There's betrayal. There's more betrayal. There's amazingly in-depth descriptions of both moment-to-moment -moment combat and how Death Guard lay siege on a planet. Really, really cool inventive stuff. Uh, and this will be the perfect way to sort of wrap this investigation up. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to finishing this thing. Uh, by the time we get here, you'll be very, very versed in Death Guard lore. Thanks a bunch for hanging out. Uh, if you enjoyed yourself, please hit like. If you want to be uh, informed as to when the Act 2 and Act 3 come online, hit subscribe. Uh, and if you're curious, uh, most of what I do is just paint models. So uh, you check out the rest of this channel and see uh, a beginner who's only been at this for a couple months, uh, how they approach learning this amazingly difficult task of painting super tiny things. I've actually upgraded my glasses since starting this because everything's so tiny. Uh, anyway, thanks again, and we'll see you for Act 2. Bye-bye.